Our next guest is a New York Times bestselling author. Her new book, Hiding in Plain Sight, is available now. Please welcome back to the show, Sarah Kenzier. How are you, Sarah? Uh, as well as can be expected. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I like that uh, in your bookshelf uh, behind you, you're using it to very, uh, very smartly uh, promote your new book. Oh, yes, <laughs> of course. Well, we were talking, you obviously had a, a book tour planned. You were actually going to be on our show in the studio uh, uh, back in, I, I guess, in March. So how has it been uh, having a book, a new book out that obviously you've worked on for years and not being able to go out and promote it? I mean, I'm sad about it. I'm sad that I didn't get to, you know, see my readers face to face, but I'm mostly thinking about safety um, and I wouldn't want to put anyone in that position. And there are certainly people who are having a much harder time uh, in this economy and in this public health crisis than me. The book itself is about the danger of this administration and the erosion of stable institutions, not just in the present, but over the last 40 years. So paradoxically, uh, this is a good time for the books to come out. So I want to uh, talk about the book, but real quick, you uh, recently tweeted the last time you were on the show, uh, and again, it was nice that you uh, got to see the other guests. Mm -hmm. uh, you were backstage, you got to meet Ice-T, and mm -hmm. here is the photo that you tweeted. And is it true that your mother, uh, your mother has this frame? Oh yeah, I gave it to her as a Mother's Day gift because I sent it to her and she loved it. And then, you know, I, I surprised her. So she has it on her mantle, just like every baby boomer, huge Ice-T fan, Law and Order, completely forgot that she confiscated my body count cassette in like 1991. So, you know. Well, it's a shame because, you know, the uh, first guest tonight was Ice Cube. So I like that there is, uh, there's something thematic about uh, the times on your, on your show. As long as this doesn't lead to Vanilla Ice the third time around, <laughs> then, then I'm all good with this trend. So, so you're, you, last time you were on, you were talking about uh, your book, You from uh, Flyover uh, Country. And, and it was a lot about sort of, uh, you had studied autocratic regimes and, and how they, you know, have this way of sneaking up on people exactly what is happening uh, to the, you know, systems they rely on. You obviously wrote this book. You couldn't imagine the moment we were in right now, but it does sort of predict that if things don't change, this is the sort of thing we were going to end up with, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't predict that I would be talking to you during a plague um, from our self-quarantine, but in terms of uh, malice, in terms of kleptocracy, in terms of the profound erosion of institutional stability and social trust, this is what I expected from the Trump administration, uh, because we've had this kind of facetious, unearned uh, you know, reliance on checks and balances that were never really there. They were not applied at the start of his administration, and he has spent the last four years annihilating them, purging agencies, packing courts, uh, you know, basically stripping this country down and selling it for parts. And so, yeah, here we are. Well, you point out that the media sometimes will focus on Trump's ineptitude, uh, but you think the mistake there is it ignores the more sinister side of it. Yes, absolutely. I think that the media, as well as many people, are just comfortable thinking of him as a buffoon that stumbled into the presidency, like it was an accident. But that's not true. And as I lay out in the book, he ran or nearly ran for president five times, 1988, 1996. He ran in 2000. He ran in 2012. He ran in 2016. And one of his enduring strategies has been to cover up his crime with scandal and to cover up his malice with incompetence. A lot of people are shocked by his reaction to the pandemic, that we haven't had um, a national mourning, that the flag hasn't even been lowered um, to commemorate the victims and the people uh, who tried to save them. But that's completely in line with his character. Uh, you know, when 9-11 happened, his first reaction was to say it made his buildings look taller. When the 2008 financial collapse happened, he said that it was a good thing for him, that he would profit. And back in 2014, he went on Fox News and said that he wanted economic collapse and he wanted riots and violence in the street because that's what makes America great again. You don't hold back in your book as far yeah. as like naming names. And, uh, and I think a way a lot of times some journalists not only fear you know, the shutting down of access uh, for, for projects that might do in the future, but also, you know, for personal safety. Uh, do you, when you are specific about people, do you, ever, do you ever fear for your safety when you write? I mean, of course. Of course, I, feel, I fear for my safety. And 
we've seen a lot of examples of this administration and people connected to it threatening people. You know, we just had an impeachment hearing where the ambassador to Ukraine basically said that Trump and his goon squad ordered a hit on her. That's a huge deal. And there's a long history of that kind of action. Um, you know, so yeah, I worry about my safety, but I'm more worried um, that the truth of this administration and its history isn't being told. And so that's what, you know, I have chosen to do uh, in this book and through my other work. And I don't care about access. You know, I live in Missouri. I'm not worried about not being <laughs> invited to a cocktail party or, you know, whatever the hell people do in DC. And so that's never really been an issue for me. And, you know, perversely, it gives me a certain kind of freedom.